Hi gals and guys, Mark here from Super 100 MPH. I'm going to post a video with four races from uh, the 1983 Australian Grand Prix which was held in Calder down in Melbourne. Um, we would have loved to have brought you the Grand Prix but uh, this happened. Yes, Peter Williamson, how are you going Willow? Uh, working very hard Gary. Yep, ran out of tape. Uh, there was also a Group E production race, uh, followed by a, a touring car support race, and this happened. David Seldon has been dispensed with. I'm not quite sure where he's got to. He's certainly a long way back. He, I can see him. He's back in about eighth or ninth place, but he was up there running equal third for a time. Now he's tenth. Nigel Greenway, our lap scorer, advises me. And he's just coming around the bend now. Minute advantage, but Fury is very close behind. Then Martin coming up next. Yep, we only got one lap of the production car race, but we only missed out on two laps of the touring car support race, so I thought I might post that. Uh, later on. It's got some really nice bits in it. Um, there was a compulsory tyre change and um, the BMW of Jim Richards was carrying that periscope camera which uh, Channel 7 called Race View but apparently some of the boys in the uh, BMW team called the U-Boat. Well on to today's video. There were four support races that we actually managed to get in full. I think we've posted some of them before but uh, we thought we might run them together for a bit of a summer video and um, uh, give us a chance to remaster some of these bits and pieces because they're quite good. Um, so it starts with the uh, Nissan Exa Turbo Super Challenge which was an eight lap race with, uh, cele uh, had celebrities in it like Jack Lafitte, uh, these guys who were in the Australian Grand Prix anyway, Alan Jones, Jeff Brabham, um, and also uh, Peter Brock and Alfie Costanzo and um, it was a good race, uh, especially the uh, Alan Jones, Jeff Brabham, Peter Brock dice. That's worth, uh, it's definitely worth watching. Uh, next up was the Group N Touring Cars, which had the uh, Mustangs, Minis and Cortinas, with Gary Rogers and John Mann battling it out there. That was a five-lap race, uh, followed by the Stafford Sport Challenge, which I think some of you have seen before. This is the 15-lap race for GT and sports cars featuring Alan Jones and his Porsche. Um, well, not his Porsche, but uh, John Fitzpatrick via Peter Fitzgerald's Porsche, Pat Romano and his uh, Cadici, and uh, Peter Brock was driving the Bob Jane Monza, which Alan Grice drove the following year. So uh, what came after that? Uh, the last one, of course, was the Sports Sedan Challenge, a five-lap race with Tino Lit. Tino Leo in his Monaro, uh, Robin Doherty in the Tirana, Mick Monteresso in the Escort, um, all good stuff. So without further ado, take it away, Gary Wilkinson, Evan Green and John Shepard. Ten identical Nissan Pulsar Exa turbos. The names are getting longer than uh, the straight. <laughs> ten identical cars prepared, in fact, by Fred Gibson to be absolutely the same, but ten very different drivers. Celebrities, Alan Jones in the black turbo, number ten. Alongside him, number eight, the name Brabham. The driver, Jeff, back from America, a great Australian competing on the American scene. 05 is Peter Brock on the second row of the grid. Alongside him, the French driver, Jacques Lafitte, car number two. Behind him, Roberto Moreno in 19, car... Uh, 31, Jim Richards. Behind them, Alfie Costanza and Chris Gibson on the back row of the grid as the flag drops. Dick Johnson and Alan Grice invited to the meeting and have to take the back row of the grid because that's the way they were balloting. Not practice, just balloting. And it's given Jones and Brabham on the front row. What a pair of names to have on the front row of the grid. And it's Jones who just goes inside Jeff Brabham. The black car is Jones. The silver one is Brabham. And the red car of Peter Brock trying to slip on the inside and way from the back in the silver green car. Dick Johnson it was who took an enormous shortcut there and maybe has just gained a little bit of ground on the field. He did balk a little when he walked in here today and found that they'd allocated him a green car, I might add. 
17 there is Nick Johnson, who started from the back row. That's Jones out in front. The car's all the same, turbocharged, 1.5, four-cylinder engines, front-wheel drive, a production car that cost about $12,000. Nissan Racing Manager Howard Marsden told me the only thing that they've done to them is put a little harder brake pads in them. And they've also got them running on Dunlop High Performance tyres. That's the that only two changes from standard. In fact, they're all carrying identical fuel loads. The depth of rubber on the tyres is all the same. And Fred Gibson, during the week, has driven all 10 cars to make sure they behave in exactly the same way. Alan Jones in, just weaving across to get a fast line through. Brabham's close behind him, and right on Brabham's tail is Peter Brock. And it's um, Jacques Lafitte, the Frenchman, in fourth place. Dick Johnson's doing all right there. He's um, managed to force his way up through the field into about fifth spot. Well, Alan Jones, oh, three abreast. <laughs> Johnson's on the inside and going just a little faster Jim is Jim Richards. Richards. Yeah. But Who's this, that on the outside? I wouldn't like to be in the car, whoever it is. Jim Richards is balking a little bit. The one on the outside is taking a suicidal line. Number four, was it? Looks like Alan Grice. It drives like Alan Grice, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, he and Dick were a little a bit annoyed that they had to start from the rear of the grid. And and they, Alfie uh, Costanzo doing some rally crossing, by the way. And Alfie, waving his head more than the steering wheel, gets back on the circuit. And Christine Gibson behind, being very ladylike and getting a great view of the mayhem going on in front. I That's hope the Christine. Hertz people aren't watching because that is, in fact, the Hertz rent a car that Alfie's driving. Well, Christine went round in a polite way and got a much faster line out of it. In fact, got back on Alfie as they came through. That's Alfie and Christine in the two yellow cars at the tail of the field. Up at the front, though, and just smoking a bit of that hard brake lining. Alan Jones, still leading from Jeffrey Brabham, Peter Brock, Jacques Lafitte. Brock in third place, pretty anxious too to try and get by Brabham, but uh, he's not getting any opportunity to do so. Eight laps is the distance. Roberto Moreno was the fifth driver there. They're all running as they were balloted. No practice. This is just the way they came out of the hat. And fancy out of the hat drawing a Jones and Brabham on the front row. Yes, it's uh, amazing, isn't it? It was a similar car to this that Christine Gibson drove at Bathurst in the James Hardy 1000, prepared, of course, to our Australian racing touring car regulations. But it was the first appearance of the... Pulsar X, or the second, it ran in the Castrol 400 at, uh, at Sandown. Just on the edge of the circuit there, a little bit rough, Jones. Straighten up now, coming down to the start-finish line with uh, five laps to go. It's Jones from Brabham, from Brock, from Lafitte, from Moreno. Then a bit of a gap back to Johnson and Grice, who've done wonderful things to get up as close as they are, because they started from the back row of the grid. These are the cheapest turbocharged cars you buy in Australia, about $12,000. <laughs> Everyone wants the, the quick line. 19 was Roberto Moreno, who will start from pole position in the Australian Grand Prix, which will be the final race on the program today. One of the yellow cars in the back there going off wide, I think, was Alfredo Costanzo. Alfie will start on the front row of the grid alongside Moreno in the Grand Prix. There's uh, Johnson following Grice around. Then a gap back to Jim Richards. The cars weaving through the S's, coming down towards Glow Weave Corner. Jones has got himself quite a handy lead. He just I think it's inched away marginally from Jeffrey Brabham, who though comes very fast through the corner, and Brock right on the tail, but because the cars are all the same, no one could do much about changing position. Well, one, two, three, four, and five are running in exactly the same order that they came off the grid. That hasn't changed, and they've got uh, four laps remaining. Alan Jones is reportedly off to Europe soon to sign a contract to return to Formula One. A shame he's not going to Japan, because whoever wins the race will win a return trip for two to Japan, courtesy of Nissan and Qantas could be a handy place for him to go but it'll be a great prize and well, if he's not available I'll you volunteer yeah 58.16 is the lap time that uh, Alan Jones has turned in on the previous lap uh, and Peter Brock who will be driving in the touring car race here today five laps start, down starting from the front row of the grid in that event alongside George Fury who in the <laughs> Nissan Bluebird turbo made fastest time in practice yesterday Christine Gibson will be driving in one of these cars in the City of Melbourne Touring Car Trophy as well. She qualified in, uh, where was it, 12th place on the grid, which was yeah. a good effort for Christine. In the Touring Car version of this, her qualifying time was 47 seconds. Jones is going around in 58. That's the difference then between a modified version of this and the absolutely standard cars such as we're seeing now. And still the order is the same. Brock's still in third place and not able to do much about getting by Jeffrey Brabham who, while he can occasionally just get a little closer to the rather stubby tail of Alan Jones's car, can't get within striking distance Top or within three, region of uh, In fact, we've got a fair gap now Good. on the rest of the field. Peter Brock looking across at the other side of the circuit as though he was trying to find some sort of shortcut. Weaving in the background is Dick Johnson with uh, Alan Grice right behind him, making life hard for Grice, who wants to get by. They're running in about fourth and fifth place. 
Brabham sticking. Oh, yes, really sticking on Jones' tail. Coming up to uh, Go Weave Corner. He's got him. But will Jones give way? He won't. When he has to go wide, Brabham is through. Brabham back from an intensive season of racing on the American scene where they drive it hard and rough. And Jeffrey Brabham making a great name for himself. Two laps side to go. Side by side with two laps to go. And Brock may have the chance now, too. He's getting a bit of a toe. That's him on the red car. Decides to stay there a bit longer. Brabham on the inside. Brock going to make a dart if he can. Hasn't got the legs. Brabham will hit the front, though. Jones on the on the outside and Brock goes through and Brock in fact might come out best of the lot he's gone right to in the middle and Brabham said where did you come from he said I come from Australia that's the way we drive over here and now Jones is making a move both have lost a bit Brabham back into second spot maybe third and they still hold on to second but Brock has gone through the crowd is cheering here a big crowd at Calder Brock's in front what a dynamic corner Brabham on the outside there Jones goes on the inside both cars weaving under brakes Jones in second spot Brabham back to third but as Brock is leading we're coming up towards the last lap, are we, Gary? Yes, coming up. Just over a lap and a bit to go. Coming into Glow Weave, they come down to the start-finish line now, and Peter Brock has a pride of place in this race. One lap to go. Alan Jones second. Jeffrey Brabham shuffled out in that last dice into uh, third spot. And that's allowed the rest of the field, in fact, to close up uh, behind them. Not that they're going to have any chance of catching the leading division. Marino is in fourth place. Dick Johnson fifth, then Alan Grice. But down into Valvoline corner for the last time, it's Peter Brock with a couple of car lengths on Alan Jones. Great passing manoeuvre on this corner last time round for Brock to get by. Oh, oh he's been nudged by Jones. He corrected, though, held it. That was a miraculous Marvelous. bit of car control. We'll see that later. He got nudged. Jones came in very close. Nothing deliberate, just they're driving desperately close together. And Alan Jones has to be content with sex. But there'll be a big grin on his face. Up go the headlights. He's winking at us. Or is it Brock that he's trying to give some sort of message to? He's saying, sorry, fella, but give me another go. I'll try it again. And he probably will. Well, he came up so close. He said, I wasn't world champion for nothing, you know. It's okay to be king of the touring car roost, but I do know a bit about driving these cars. And Jeffrey Brabham coming up very close behind Jones as well. Said, well, if you can do it, maybe I can. Here's my nose. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> You've got to hand it to Brock. He uh, got out of that okay, and he still clings to the lead. That manoeuvre didn't come off for Brabham. Jones holds down second place, but it's going to be Peter Brock to take the chequered flag. Then it's Alan Jones. And then in car number 19, Roberto Moreno got up to pass a somewhat displaced and disgruntled Brabham, who has to be content with fourth place, because Moreno, at the very last moment, got up in car number 19 across the line. Well, what a remarkable race, and what a great morale booster for Peter Brock, who'll be featuring in the touring car race just a little later on today. Peter Brock, the winner of the Nissan Turbo Super Challenge, Alan Jones in second place, and uh, Roberto Marino, in fact, getting up just to pip Jeffrey Brabham for third spot right on the line. We'll be back at Calder after this break. Every now and then, something different comes along that's so exciting it makes you want to... Introducing the new Pulsar Exa Turbo. With turbo efficiency, turbo economy, turbo performance. Pulsar Exa Turbo. At around $12,000 plus on-road costs, it's going to go mighty quick from your Nissan dealer now. Well, there weren't any spills, but there were thrills aplenty in the uh, Nissan Turbo Challenge uh, with all the top uh, local and overseas drivers competing in that last event and Peter Brock doing miraculous things. Firstly, on the second last of the eight-lap event to get the lead here, coming down into Valvoline Corner. At this stage, Brabham challenging Jones for the lead and getting it. Brock had been lurking in there behind them. Now, watch this inside passing manoeuvre by Peter Brock. He gets Jones and Brabham both in one go. Jones can see the wisdom of the manoeuvre and tries to follow suit. And in fact does get through to take second place, but uh, Peter Brock, brilliant stuff to take the lead in the race. That was with about uh, a lap and three quarters to go. Now, on the last lap, Brock leading, Jones second, and Jones so anxious to get through, as you can see there, really gave Peter a nudge, but uh, Brock did remarkably well to hold on and go on and win the race. Alan Jones filling second place, and right on the line, Roberto Marino getting up for third. For the presentation after that race, let's take you now to Evan Green. Well, the Nissan Turbo has been run and won by Peter Brock. And if I can just bring him away from the other drivers. The, the big shock at the back here, Peter, is they've all discovered that it was worth $7,000. As Alan Jones has said, if I'd known it was $7,000, I'd have hit you harder. Well, that's, I don't blame the guy. I mean, we're having a lot of fun out there, but uh, seven grand is pretty serious business, yeah. yeah. Alan, can you come up here? Jonesy. You look as though you had that one for a long time. Well, that's right, but as I said, if I would have known it was seven grand, I would have braked at all. I would have used him. <laughs> 
Peter, how on earth did you control the car after you got hit? Because from where we were sitting, it looks like you're out and off into the railway line somewhere. Well, we don't, obviously, uh, not trying to say the wrong thing, but the little front wheel drive car is understeer, uh, which means the front tyre slides sideways. But when Alan hit me, it knocked the tail around beautifully. I just kept it flat and it pointed in the right direction, went out of the corner like a rocket. Well, there's a cue for Howard Marsden, who's Nissan's development manager. If he only could build that into the cars, Howard, you might end up with a sensational machine. Absolutely right, but we have been trying to say to people in Australia for the past couple of years that advanced uh, engineering design and motorsport go hand in hand. You couldn't have had a better uh, example of that than we've seen today. I'd like to say very quickly thank you to the international drivers for taking part because it's tremendous to see them in Australia. It's very good for Australia that these people come and drive in our country. I think also we should congratulate Nissan on their great support of motorsport in Australia and of course in providing cars for entertainment like this. Yes, and and of course we do put the uh, first prize of the EXA upon the, uh, the Grand Prix and we're very proud to do that as well as put on this little demonstration. Will it be the car that got hit by Alan Jones or something a little newer? It's a matter of whether Alan Jones wins the prize or not. <laughs> well, you have a, a cheque to present to the, to the winner. The prize, in fact, is for a return trip for two to Japan by courtesy of Nissan and Qantas, but the value is $7,000. Delighted with the uh, assistance that Qantas have given us in this matter, but uh, Peter Brock, if I could offer uh, a prize to Peter at the moment, there is one provisor. Peter has won this prize, but he must take this trip on the first weekend of October of next year. <laughs> Peter, well done. Thanks, Howard. And it's back to you, Gary. Thank you very much, Evan Green. He's a smart man, that uh, Howard Marsden, isn't he, John yes, Shepard? Yes, obviously. He uh, knows the right thing to say at the right time. We return here to uh, find cars circulating in preparation for the start of a five-lap event for Group N touring cars. A bit of nostalgia here for you if uh, you were brought up on these machines in the, uh, in the 50s and uh, early 60s. I hate to admit, As John Gary, Shepard but I was. <laughs> yes, I was about to. He took the words out of my mouth. Uh, but they are, it is a great sight to see them, isn't it? I mean, it restored to, to top racing condition, and uh, the marvellous thing about it is that uh, not only did the public get a great kick out of it, but a lot of the drivers are rediscovering the thrill of driving these it's, cars. It's, it's a really great form of sport, and uh, one of the things about it, because of the modern technology, they don't bust quite as often as they used to, so we usually see full-length races with, with dices from end to end, which is really good. like Gary Rogers in the Mustang on the front row of the grid, it certainly is, and alongside him in car number seven, Barry Jump, as the field roars away and getting a very good start off the second line in car 54 is John Mann, also in a Mustang, and there's a little Mini there trying to spear down the inside as they go towards Valvoline Corner, in fact there's a couple of Minis trying to squeeze through there on the inside without success, and Rogers has the lead going round the corner from car 54, John Mann, the Mustang's first and second, there's a Cortina sandwiched in there for third along with uh, a whole swag of Minis the back straight. Looks like we're in for a repeat of yesterday's performance with these two cars stacking on the dice again. Yes, and number seven, uh, another Ford Mustang, Barry Jump slotting into third place now, ahead of uh, that little yellow Mini, the number I haven't been able to, uh, to cite up to this point, so I can't tell you who it is. Actually, Jumpy's a long way down the field, Gary, he, he made a very poor start, that's his brother in the, in the Cortina in third position. Oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm confused by the numbers. I don't quite know where Barry is, in fact he seems to be a long way down the field. It's car number one in fact in third place, uh, not seven. Ah oh, yes, there's uh, Jump now in the other Mustangs going through the corner in four, five, six, seven, eight, about eighth spot. Interesting, I was talking with John Mann before in the, the Gagan lookalike car there and he was saying that he was only running on seven cylinders yesterday so we'll see if his extra cylinder helps him. So it's still Gary Rogers then, just leading from John Mann and car number seven there, Barry Jump, is back in uh, ninth place. Trying to make up ground and driving very hard as you can see, but he's got these cars to get by, the ones you just saw flash by in front of Mini and uh, Anglia. Yes, well of course Jump was right up there with uh, the two cars presently at the head of the field in yesterday's race, wasn't he? Right, the standing lap by the way, 58.1 seconds from a standing start, and it's Greg. It's uh, Rogers, rather, who goes over in front of Mann. Car number one then, Barry Jump in the Cortina. 
under charge from a Bruce Allen in the uh, in the little mini right behind him going through the corner. Oops, and talking of going through the corners and almost going through the fence. The Jagger of uh, Kevin Anker just stopped at a discreet distance, enough to be able to turn around and not bend the uh, yeah, big the sigh of relief there, I would imagine. That would have been an expensive shunt, but he's controlled the car and. Off he goes, a car that really distinguished itself in Australian touring car racing in the hands of drivers like David Mackay and Ron Hodgson. The flags are out to warn of two and a half laps remaining in this race. A strange line being taken. taken. A shortcut, yes. Well, a rather long one. Bruce Allen, who was featuring uh, up among the leaders, went very wide, came back on the track. It's taken a little while just to get the car wound up. So small the minis that even the angler behind seems to be something like a towering inferno. Rogers leads from John Pan. An anchor showing that he can go off the track in more than one place. Greg Jupp is in third place going down into the corner and I noticed that um, Barry Jupp in the other uh, Mustang has now moved up into fifth place. Man trying a whole variety of lines there to try and get by Rogers. His car now almost out of sight behind the Mustang with the blue stripe, the one with the red and blue is back, what, two lengths, I suppose, but coming in deep on the corners and going around in a different fashion, as you can see. A lot of sideways slide there. The cars, of course, because of the rules, required to run on much narrower tyres than is common these days, just as they used to run back in the early 60s. Gary Rogers, though, is following a fairly impeccable line there. And as they come up to greet the last lap board, it's Rogers still out in front, but man, Trying all sorts of lines across the track. Rogers now goes to the inside of the car for him. Man goes up on the outside. That might be what he needs. He prefers the outside line. Rogers had to be much tighter through the bend. Can man get the big switch through? Can he go on the inside or will Rogers hold that tight line? Rogers is holding the line and man in frustration has to be content with seeing the blue and white Mustang just stay in front of him. Behind them, the Jupp brothers now running third and fourth in the Cortina and the Mustang. You can see there on the left of screen in the background. Barry Jupp desperate to get past in the Mustang. Well, Mann has two corners to get by Rogers as well, so a couple of scraps going on here. Mann still in second spot. He has one bend left, glow weave. Can he do it? He'll have to go wide and try and come in underneath Rogers, but I think Rogers is too wily a hand to give the corner away. Comes in fairly tight, and it'll be a straight out sprint for the line, and Rogers should hold it just to lead John Mann across the line. He goes wide on the track, Mann goes with him. They're both going for the checker flag. It'll be Rogers first, Mann second, and in third place in the Cortina, but just in front of his brother by <laughs> about a number plate width was the latest Cortina of uh, Jupp. Greg Jupp in third spot. And that's the way they finished. Gary Rogers in the Mustang, John Mann in the Mustang, and to make it a Ford Trio, Greg Jupp in the Lotus Cortina. Back with the action in just a moment here at Calder International Motor Raceway. If you set your sights high, if you're ready for more, if you reach for the sky, yes you're ready for more, if you're ready for more, if you know what's your aim, yes you're ready for more, if TRX lights your flame. New Bluebird TRX offers much more, if you're ready. Stafford Sports Challenge for GT and sports cars and by gee what dynamite machinery Evan Green. The most powerful cars you'll see assembled on the grid of any Australian circuit and on the front row two monsters of contrasting style the imported Porsche from America the John Fitzpatrick racing car and the J David racing outfit to be driven by Alan Jones that's the car on the left the blue and white car alongside from Queensland that's Alan Jones in the in the Porsche reputed to have 880 horsepower in the tail of this car twin turbos alongside Bap Romano and Bap Romano is complaining because he's only got 385 well he has a three litre Cosworth motor a car built in Queensland and Bap comes from there uh, watch him drive though he's a great driver number seven Peter Brock in the car that was demolished the, uh, at the Adelaide meeting what three months ago the Bob Jane Monza right. uh -huh. and uh, alongside uh, yeah here's a car we didn't see yesterday yes. alongside Brock that's right the Italian driver Gian Piero Moretti Makes Momo wheels. If you've got a special steering wheel in your car and some Momo, here's a man who makes them and here's a man you've made a millionaire. He missed the race yesterday when the battery went flat on the, the dummy grid and couldn't make the start of the race. Alongside, uh, or in the next row rather, Tony Edmonton, former Australian sports sedan champion in the Alfa Romeo with a six litre Chevy V8 engine alongside him and alongside him on the grid is the turbocharged 
BMW of Jim Richard, 1.8 litres of turbocharge 4, and we have the camera in the car, and that's the view that you'll get along with Jim Richards as you take part in this 15-lap race, the Stafford Sports Sedan Challenge. Further back on the grid, car number three, Rusty French in the Porsche that uh, Alan Jones drove to, to uh, such great success last year, winning every race in the Australian Sports Sedan GT Championship. And alongside him in car number 10, John Briggs, another BMW Turbo. Car 17, Brian Thompson in the Mercedes-Benz sports car. Alongside him, Bob Jolly in car 12 for Tirana. Quickly through the rest of the field, Ray Hanger in 24, Tony Hubbard in 15, Robin Doherty in 18, John Lusty in 44, John Goulet in 6, Larry Cog in 90, and at the tail of the field in car 4, Alan Brown. Off on the warm-up lap. cars competed in one race yesterday, Alan Jones won from, that's Alan weaving to put them, walked into the tyres and he won from Peter Brock in the Monza and Bat Romano in the car on the right, the white Kadicha, Rusty French driven off the track quite deliberately I say, uh, something wrong with the car, he's still got it going, maybe trying just to hobble back to the pits, that's bad luck for him at such a late stage in the race but I'd say he was out of it, the car's just weaving around the back of the track at the moment towards Qantas Corner and uh, the tyres were very important. Speaking to Peter Rock afterwards, he said Alan Jones won because he had a better choice of tyres. Rusty French wants more than tyres. I think something wrong with the motor at the back, something in that rear end of the car. He is certainly out of the race, and that would be a sheer frustration for Rusty French. The biggest race of the year in terms of audience and interest, and he's out of it, and he would be fuming, having done so well in the other sports and GT races during the year. Well, Alan Jones can't be happy with the amount of temperature in the tyres. He's really weaving it down this main straight now, trying to put some heat into it. Rusty French, he's got some heat in himself. He does look upset, doesn't he? Oh, it's been a short outing for Rusty, and he will be very unhappy indeed, because he prides himself on performance. I'll talk about performance. You'll see it from uh, the top three or four cars on the grid here. There's, again, the race cam picture out of the uh, BMW as he draws up uh, to take his place on the third row of the grid alongside Tony Edmondson, immediately behind Moretti and Brock, and up ahead of him on the front row, Alan Jones in the Porsche 935. The choice of tyres critical. I notice that Romano is now running on Avon's. Jones is on good years. Can't quite see the brand on uh, Peter Brock's car. He's got Romano's car, of course, is a Kadicha, an Australian built machine. Much lighter, built to a more advanced form. The green flag goes. Side by side, Romano makes the best. He's away first. And he's getting in front of Jones, trying to move over. Jones says, hang on, fella, I'm around. And the great power of the Porsche suddenly comes to life. Look at Moretti coming up in third spot as well. The red car just trying to Brock shovel the Brock inside. out. Brock stays on the inside, though, and puts Moretti out of the way. And Brock in the third place, Moretti back to fourth. But it's this man leading the race. The 1980 world champion, Alan Jones, in front. Behind him, Romano, the little white car bobbing up and down. With Brock trying to come up on the outside. Moretti goes on the inside, and Brock takes third spot again. So it's Porsche 1, Porsche 3, and Kadicha in second spot, Monza 4. Big follow that. If you can't, it's Jones. And Romano in second Romano. spot, and uh, really desperately trying to clink a second spot too, because Edmonton he can't spin there. Edmonton has spun. Edmonton has spun. He gets off the track without being clobbered. He's going around the marker there to come back on the track for Tony Edmonton, the Tasmanian, in the Alpha. He's a long way back, giving the field an enormous start. Only the clerk of the course's car behind, and this man to catch half a lap away. The uh, Kadicha of Romano doing a remarkable job, you know, to try and stick with Jones. He's pulled away from uh, Moretti and from Brock. Hasn't got the same straight line speed as the big Porsches, but by gee, it corners phenomenally well, doesn't it, the uh, Kadicha? If you look how he drives, he's a man of immense heart. His grand lusty gone off the track in his uh, Celica. This is the Kadicha, built in Queensland, built to race at circuits like Le Mans in the 24-hour race. 500 horsepower was the standing lap time. Just can't keep up with the Porsche when Alan Jones winds it up, but he does go fast around the corners. Mind you, so does Alan Jones. John Fitzpatrick, who won Bathurst back in 1976 with uh, Bobby Morris, is now resident in California, runs the J. David Racing Team this, with these Porsches. Flew this car across, the, the price we hear is about $14,000 in air freight. Flew it across for Alan Jones to drive here today and it's to run next weekend in the uh, Hume's Guardrail Adelaide Trophy Meeting at uh, the Adelaide International Raceway. This is Moretti, the Italian who under very strong pressure from Peter Brock yeah. too. He built Momo wheels. The, the choice of the names is interesting. The first MO is from his name Moretti, the second MO is from Monza. 
Right now he's at Calder, probably wishing he was at Monza, where the, the Porsche going through now would probably be going quicker, but still he is in front of Peter Brock and doing a good job for his first visit to the circuit here. The car does look different in shape to the uh, Porsche that Alan Jones is driving. Weaves a bit there. There's a homegrown car, a Chevy Monza, an American car to start with, but the modifications are purely Australian. Peter Brock driving hard. Look at him working at the wheel, trying to catch up. He's got about 600 horsepower, the big Chevy V8. He is quick around the corners, which is surprising. Can't quite keep up with the twin turbocharged blast from the Porsche on the long straight. Let's see how they go. Moretti puts his foot down, and you can see the Porsche just pulling away. Now, Brock's got to do it under brakes. Brock loves driving this car. Alan Jones continues to lead the race with ten and a half laps remaining. There he is, heading down the back straight into Qantas Corner and has uh, widened the gap now between himself and Bap Romano and the Khadija. Jim Richards in the turbocharged BMW. That's the view he's got, that's the view you've got. We've turned the camera, he didn't turn the car. Don't go running out of your living room. Brian Thompson is just in front of him in the Mercedes-Benz, the Shepparton entry. Jim Richards, probably the smallest engine car in the race, turbocharged. And people think, well, he's a turbo, he should do better, but he's also up against turbos with much larger capacity than those Porsches, for instance. This is the more coming down the, the main drive. straight. Brian Thompson has that Mercedes cracking today. He's really got it going. There's a puff of brake smoke from the, the white car just in front there. He goes inside the... Uh, Mercedes, as does Jim Richards. Tom got went a bit Thompson. wide there. That's his other BMW. That's Briggs in front, yes. John the Briggs, the South Australian driver in the other BMW. Jim must have had trouble early on to be so far back in the field. His practice time was quicker, but he certainly was delayed early in the race to be back with uh, Thompson and Briggs. Now he has Briggs to get by, his old car. In the meantime, the race still being led by this man, Alan Jones, passing the rather forlorn side of Rusty French's car, the car that he drove last year, parked in infield. Also passing some of the tail enders now too, Alan Jones. And talking of tail enders, a brilliant recovery being staged by Tony Edmonds and he's back up there almost on Jim Richards' tail. We might see that a little later on. But in the meantime, this is the order of the field. It's Alan Jones in the Porsche, leading Bap Romano in the Cadiccia. 2.63 seconds is the margin between first and second. Giampiero Moretti, the Italian, in a Porsche. Peter Brock in the Chevy Monza. John Briggs in the BMW, and we've got Brian Thompson there. In actual fact, he's just been passed there by Jim Richards to put two BMWs, five and six, in the leaderboard. The car that Alan is driving, you can see the typical flare of, of exhaust fire from the turbocharger engine. Nothing wrong with the car, they just do that. The car he's driving is quite extensively modified by John Fitzpatrick, or Rob Jolly pulling out towards the pits if he can. He's just hit the start of the pit row and he's pulling his Tirana in. He's been modified by John Fitzpatrick in the suspension so that the car doesn't bob and dip its nose under acceleration or braking as the previous Porsche did and it's very stable. The track will unsettle it but what's the way when he brakes how the, the nose stays stable? That means he can turn in more accurately, he can accelerate harder knowing he's not going to lose steering. See, he accelerates now. 880 horsepower turn loose there and the car is remaining flat and stable. Jones circulating in just over 40 seconds, about 40.5 seconds per lap. That had put him on the respectable third or fourth row of the grid for the Australian Grand Prix. If he could circulate that continuously in the Australian Grand Prix, he might win a turn. Exactly. He reckons he will in the race. He reckons he can circulate in the very low 40s and over 100 laps. That could give him the race. Seven, six laps remaining for Alan Jones as he comes over the start-finish line this time. This is such an important race for Alan Jones. He won his world championship in 1980. Romano. He defended it in 1981 and lost to Nelson Piquet. There's Jim Richards still batting his way up through the field. Alan then retired, had a year out of it, came back and ran in the Porsche 935 last year for Alan Hamilton, won every race in Australia. Ran a couple of events earlier this year for the Arrows team and almost certainly will go back into Formula One next year, but needs a good result today in the, in the Australian Grand Prix. He'll certainly get a good result, though, in this race, I'd say, because he's, he's clearing out. Jim Richards, in the meantime, struggling very hard to make up ground. That's the view from inside his car, left-hand drive car. We just turn the camera a little bit. You can see what revs he's doing and watch the instruments, the turbo boost. He's got to watch that while he's watching the road, changing gear, doing the other things to keep a driver busy. You can see how his hands are working. He's a busy fella. The racing driver does earn his money. And there's uh, Tony Hubbard parked across the track in a perilous spot. Another car that came into contact with him just weaving Ray over Hanger. there. By gee, he's uh, got a crooked hanger by the look of it. Yeah, a little bit twisted there. 
Yes, you can see where we've got a, a bent hanger at the back, all right. The two of them have come into to contact there. That's not a good place to be left. A bit of fiberglass across the, the track where the two of them did touch. Hanger now just trying to go back to the pits, get out of the way. His race is running. See the bodywork that's lodged at the back and at a, a curious angle. Hubbard's moving again out of that dangerous position at the end of uh, the straight down the Valvoline corner. We'll see if we can see that again. Left something behind there when he drove away. That's part of Ray Hanger's car, I think. Let's see it again. If we can pick it up. Whoa, just caught the tail end of it. There was, I yes. think, a third car involved there that escaped uh, unscathed. The third one looks suspiciously like Alan Jones. There was a blue tail of a Porsche going through, and it's the only blue tail I know. They touched before. It may be seeing him come that one of them moved just a little bit to one side to give more room to, to Jones. Whatever it was, they touched in the braking area for Valvoline Corner and Hanger and the car behind Tony Hubbard both went out. It looks as though they may be going back to the pit together to have a conversation about the interpretation of the rules. Three laps to go for Alan Jones, who's just passed the start-finish line, now goes to Balvaline Corner and has a lead of about 65 metres over Bap Romano, the Queenslander in the Khadija. And there's a huge dice still going on for third place between... Uh, Brock and Moretti. Brock, Brock and Moretti, yeah. yeah. Brock's got him. Brock just squeaked through there on Valvoline Corner to take over third place. He's been pursuing that now for 12 laps. Moretti's Porsche looks so low, it almost seems to be an underground model. It seems lower than, than this one. It may just be the paintwork. Whatever it is, this is the car that's going. Alan Jones, two laps to go now. Passing Brian Thompson's car, just lapping the Mercedes. Thompson, a very courteous as well as a very skilled driver, gets well out of the way, but it's Jones to go through. Jones now has Briggs just in front of him in the turbocharged BMW, the white car. Well, this will encourage Alan Jones, takes his motorsport seriously and wants people to take him seriously. A few are saying, oh, is he coming back, but is he still any good? Well, he's showing he's still top class. He's very fit too, Gary. I saw him during the week and he'd been up to surface as we just sit in the car with Jim Richards towards the closing stage of the race. Alan's lost quite a few kilograms of weight. He's very strong and very fit. He's had three months of intensive get fit uh, work up there at surface and it really is a ball of muscle. Here's Jim Richards struggling to, uh, through the field. He's in fifth spot. Alan Jones is in front and he's on his last lap as well, heading down the uh, general credits back straight towards Qantas Corner for the last time. Just about uh, two or three more bends and uh, the race will be his. He still maintains that big lead over Bab Romano and the Kanicha and Peter Brock now holding down third place ahead of uh, Moretti. But it's all Alan Jones. Took out the first heat here yesterday in similar fashion ahead of Peter Brock and is going to hand out the same treatment today to Bab Romano. Romano though has driven a great race. Let's give him full credit. That's Sir Hubbard back in the race just trying to finish. But Jones will win. There's the checkered flag for Alan Jones and Bab Romano will get second spot. He is behind by about 500 metres. He goes across the line now. That white car, beautifully made Kadicha from Queensland. Here comes Peter Brock to take third spot. Giampera Moretti from Italy is fourth in the Porsche. Those are the leading four. It should be Richards to come through next and Tony Edmonton, who was put to the back of the field in a brilliant effort to bring the Alfa Romeo up into sixth spot. But they are the leading three, Alan Jones, Bap Romano and Peter Brock. Back with the action and a talk again to Alan Jones in just a few moments. John Sands Seeger SC 3000 personal computer makes its debut on Earth. Now there's no need to wait until tomorrow. Seeger technology is here today. Seeger is learning. Seeger is music. Seeger is incredible graphics. And Seeger plays games like no other personal computer plays games. At around $300, you certainly don't have to wait until tomorrow. Seeger is here today. For more than a hundred years, John Sands has known all about winning, which is one of the reasons why the John Sands Seeger computer is here today, way, way in front of anything else in its field, the true leader in the personal computer class. There's not much doubt uh, who gets the trophy after the uh, Stafford Sport Trophy race for GT cars and sports cars. After the heat yesterday and the heat today, convincing winner on both occasions, Alan Jones. Where are you, Jones? Come on, son. Stop kissing the girls. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, two big wins yesterday and today, and uh, you really spaced them. Oh, well, a pretty good car. That helps. Well, yeah. Well, come on, you're not that modest. There's always a good driver that helps too, isn't it? 
Yeah, it helps, but you know the car's fantastic, and uh, it's a car that's had two or three years of really intensive development. And John Fitzpatrick just flew it out from America two days ago, and uh, I think an indictment of his preparation is we we hardly had to touch it. We just took it off the aeroplane, put it on the track, and away I've, she went. I've never known Fitz to keep such a low profile. Yes, it's a bit suspicious, isn't it? <laughs> Mr. Pat Swert is here from Stafford Allenson to make the presentation. Alan, congratulations. Thank you very much. Well, wonderful. Congratulations on a wonderful drive in the Porsche 935 Thank you. and the Stafford Sport Trophy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Don't go away for just a moment because um, Mr. Keith Marshall, the Managing Director of John Sands, is here also to make a presentation to you. You can use this. <laughs> Alan, on behalf of John Sands, great race and congratulations. You're a bit lucky that our driver dropped out there with a drop gearbox, but I'm sure you'll be able to use our John Sands Seeger computer to keep track of all your wins. Thank you, thank you very much, and I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to publicly uh, thank John Sands for being the sponsor of this meeting. Uh, we need more people like him, and uh, it's people like John Sands that sponsor not only Rusty French and his team of cars, but come to the support of this Grand Prix, and I thank him very much. And Stafford Sport, of course. OK, thank you very much to Stafford Allenson, to John Sands, and particularly congratulations to Alan Jones, and also to the guys that filled the placings both today and yesterday, Matt Romano from Queensland and, of course, from Melbourne, Peter Brock. Right, we'll be back with more after this. A five-lap sports sedan challenge is the next event here at Calder. And while we're waiting for cars to assemble on the grid, then go on the warm-up lap. John Shepherd, you were down in the pit area during the big, very fruitious City of Melbourne tourist car race to judge the best, most efficient uh, pit stop carried out by a crew. Now, there's a prize award from both TAA and Channel 7 Sports. Who won it? To whom do you award it? I suppose before I get to that part, Evan, I'd like to just tell people what the thing was judged on because a lot of the blokes themselves in the pit were confused about whether it was just on time and so forth. It was judged on the gen general presentation of the team, their dress, etc. The housekeeping of the pit, whether that was nice and tidy. The speed and accuracy of the pit stop. Um, and if it was in fact cool, calm and collected. And having said all those things, the winners were the Nissan team. Here they come again then. Let's watch the stop. This is George Fury coming in on his way to victory in the race. So here he comes now. John Shepard has given this stop the award for the TAA 7 Sport Pit Crew Award. And very quick, very efficient. Watch how people aren't running. The man at the back knew he had to pick up the wheel. He just walked around because he knew how long it would take a man to receive the, the wheel, to tighten it up. Howard Marsden in front, watching cool, calm, watching when they're finished. Out he goes. Yes. Good lad, says Howard Marsden. And they've won the award. Thank you, John Shepherd. And cars on the grid now for the Sports Sedan Challenge over five laps. On the front row, Robin Doherty in car number 18, which is a Tirana. The car's all heavily disguised. Alongside him, car 12, Mick Monteresso in an Escort with a great scoop in the front to be magnificent for collecting coal on a winter's morning. Further back, 85 is Tino Leo and alongside Ken Lusty in 43. Then Charlie Milner and Larry Cog. On the next row, car 39, Jeff Monday and John Chambers in 47. 17, Ray Ellis. 11, Ivan Piatranesi. 28, Michael Jacobson. 21, Bernie Watt. 29, Paul Stewart. And 3, Rex Muldoon. Watch him, he went so well earlier. 53, John Anderson. 10, Gary Arant in the V-Dub. 72, Jeff Groves. 34, John Horton. And at the back, car 9, Jeff Watson. And 20, Bill Emony. That's the way they are. 20 starters, 5 laps the distance. A good crowd here at Calder today, and the circuit is such that spectators can be spread across quite a vast area and give you a deceptive idea of the number here, but it looks like the biggest crowd we've seen for quite some time, and they've had a great day's racing with the John Sands Australian Grand Prix still to come. This is just the warm-up lap. You can see spectators camping here. A quite a pleasant day, a little cooler now than it was earlier on, around the back straight, General Credit Straight, which just runs up to the tight uh, corner known as Qantas corner these days. They're on the back straight now with Doherty leading and just winding around a little bit. Some people come here in style, others just get here. Some just arrive. A flag marshal on the left behind his little protective barrier with a bundle of flags, the colour of which indicates different things. I think that marshal has discovered someone of interest among the crowd. 
quite a mixture of cars here. That yellow VW with the chop front and curious tail went very hard in an earlier race, John Shepard. The, the, the little Beetles and Minis still survive, don't they? Yes, uh, uh, it's interesting to see these cars, as you say, still surviving. They, some of them, and uh, Ken Hastings' car was a classic, used to have a FVA, FVC Ford in the back of it, and it was a very, very quick little car. Well, here's the Beetle coming now, the little yellow one. And uh, you, you tend to find this with these sports sedans. It's a, the last outpost of the specials, as, uh, as I've heard said a time or two. And um, Bob James Old Bathurst car, isn't it? Very, very uh, interesting cars. And the car you see on the screen now, number 20, is Bob Jane's Old Bathurst car. Yes. And the days of the XU ones. Well, the grid now assembled on the front row. Robin Doherty in 18 in pole position, 44.5, which was 1.0. Or 0.18 of a second faster than Mick Monteraso in practice. The bigger car should be expected to get away quick. Monteraso is very fast for the less, but that's a white car in the middle of your screen. The green light goes on, and side by side they go. There's nothing much in it. Although for further back, Charlie Milner has made a very good start in the red Toronto. That's a red car on the outside and picked up one or two places. But no, he will go through first. Monteraso slots in right behind in second spot with Tino Leo back in third. That's the way they started, but the first two already have opened up quite a gap of about five car lengths. Second spot is Mick Monteresso. It takes a while to wind this little escort up, but when he does, it flies, so watch him. Though he still leads, Monteresso is now closer. Only five laps, so he knows he has to get by at the first opportunity. Not much of a chance for tactics in this race. He gets up close, he's come through very fast, and already he's made a challenge. He's on the inside, but the big, uh, the bigger engine of the Tirana pulls away. Monteresso has to be content to slot in the side. But being so much lighter, he can be expected to do something under brake. The Monaro of Leo is up there in third spot, and he's made up a lot of ground. Watch him, the man running third. He is very, very close to Monteresso there. The car is quick down the straights. Dino Leo then has uh, done well. He's pulling up on the inside of Monterezzo. In fact, may make a challenge for this corner. He has gone hard. No, he leads. Monterezzo comes on the inside and just shoulders Monterezzo out of the way. Uh, Leo, rather. Monterezzo has to be content now with third spot. Leo up to second. Leo did show a lot of pace in the Monaro down the, the straight last time. Let's see if he has enough pace now to hold off first the escort. Monterezzo tried to get on the inside. Leo holds off the second. And now he'll be off after Doherty. Doherty has gone by with a lead of almost 100 metres. And this car in second spot, and there's the field. Chasing him, Monteresa back in third spot, Leo in second. Leo started from the second row alongside car 43, Ken Lusty. Hello, something's come adrift. It, it did before the start. He actually started the race in that way. Apparently was if not mortally wounded, at least John Chambers' Gemini, and that's what it is, beneath all the disguise, did suffer some damage. It's amazing what you can do with race tape, isn't it? Yes, I think he's probably lightened the car a bit. Even that's <laughs> probably his story. Well, Leo's still holding on to second spot, but that will cost him a bit of time, and that does allow Monteresso to get just a little bit closer. But Doherty, who's Tirana, makes a shattering noise down the straight, manages to hold on to his place. Leo has probably gained a little bit. He has picked up just a little bit of ground on the leader. And Monteresso still holding, but not certainly making any impression on the big Monaro just in front of him. Doherty running a 5-litre V8. Leo second, the 5.8-litre Holden Monaro. Ken Lusty, indulging in a little bit of gentle spinning. Just parking the car in the grass. There's only one left to go in the race, and this is the battle for the second spot. The leader, Doherty, is through. Leo still leads Monteresso, although Monteresso is showing that he'd like to get back that second spot. He might have given up the chance of winning this race, despite having started from the front row, but he'd love to have second spot. Yeah, I think Leo made a, made a mistake because in fact he was uh, just under a second behind and he's dropped back to two seconds and he's making it up again so might have made a little indiscretion somewhere. Yeah, Car number 39 uh, spinning out at the end of the straight, Jeff Mundy. Now loses a lot of ground, not that it would have made much difference to the outcome of the race because uh, we're coming around, that's car number 42, Charlie Milner in uh, fourth spot as the leader goes through and uh, takes the checkered flag. And Leo still holds on to second spot ahead of Monteresa. Not a great deal between the three of them.
maybe only a second and a half. First to second, Doherty to Leo with Monterosso in third spot. That's the way they finished in the Sport and Stand Challenge here in Calder, Melbourne International Raceway this afternoon. Back to the action, which will be the John Sands Australian Grand Prix in just a moment. Well, thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. But I will put up that um, touring car support race, even though it's minus the first two laps. It was a 40-lap race, and uh, some of the views from the camera and things like that were very good. So uh, until then, um, if you haven't subscribed already, please do. And if you like this video, hit the like button. Until next time, bye. Wow.